Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for yet another uh, digital twin week session. For those of you uh, I haven't met, my name is Adam Beck. I'm Executive Director of the Smart Cities Council for Australia and New Zealand, uh, and your host for Digital Twin Week 2020. We're about halfway through Digital Twin Week now, exactly at the halfway point. Uh, and this morning we had a great session uh, featuring uh, four very different case studies from uh, from Australia. And this evening we head all the way over to the UK uh, with our co-hosts, the Centre for Digital Built Britain. I'll introduce our guests in a short while. Uh, just a couple of uh, notes for those of you that may not have been to the Digital Twin Week program, please go and check that out on our website, digitaltwinweek.com. As you can see, we're halfway through. There's a lot of diversity still yet to come. Tomorrow is a very big day. We have four sessions coming up. We start in the morning with our co-hosts Oricon, where we're going to be talking not only about um, digital twin technology, but also the role of humans and how we can build capacity and opportunity around uh, applying digital twins. Uh, we've got a session then uh, with our co-hosts Veris. We'll be talking about the application of digital twin uh, and similar technologies and the use of data in our greenfield areas and um, also our regional areas. And we've got a great panel uh, coming up on that one, a short one hour session. Uh, early afternoon, our friends at the Water Services uh, Association of Australia are going to bring together a conversation uh, around all things optimization uh, using data and assets. They'll be touching on rail. They'll also be touching on water assets. Uh, and we finish up tomorrow um, with a session. We're going to be going back to the UK uh, and we'll have friends from Highways England, um, also High Speed Rail 2, uh, but we'll also have New Zealand, uh, the Auckland, um, sorry, the New Zealand Transport Agency joining us as well, uh, along with Auckland Airport. So tomorrow is a packed day and we finish up on Friday with a two hour uh, hands-on workshop with policymakers and practitioners as we sort of shape and co-create the digital twin strategy for Australia and New Zealand, which is currently in very early draft form. So if you'd like to get involved in some tangible actions and opportunities for growing the marketplace, please register and join us for that last session on Friday. Some housekeeping, we're using the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, the questions box is activated, please use that uh, at any time and uh, we'll be able to address some of those questions uh, later after our guests uh, share their presentations. Also, the recording of this session will be available on our YouTube channel this time tomorrow, uh, and it'll also be posted to the Digital Twin Hub, where, of course, you can um, download uh, a range of Digital Twin resources, be part of the community, uh, and have uh, have chat and conversation with your, with your peers, and also information there, uh, of course, around a very exciting new um, initiative that we um, mentioned and revealed earlier today in our case study session around the Digital Twin Challenge for 2021. Um, we've got a page up on the Digital Twin Hub at the moment that provides a little bit of information about that. Uh, I would like to highlight that registration of interest is open now. We'll be launching formally in March 2021, but we'd love to get an indication uh, of both not only uh, public sector, but also private sector stakeholders who may wish to support and be part of that. We're looking for 10 projects and 10 organisations, so 10 in total, five from local government, local councils, and five from state, territory, regional agencies as well. Infrastructure, urban development, uh, organisation-wide digital twin strategy, we'd love to get a diversity of use cases and case studies in there, and for a year to two years, we'll work together and build out some model templates. So more on the Digital Twin Challenge over the coming months. So let's get into it this evening. We've got our guests uh, online. We have uh, Mark and Miranda uh, and Sam, uh, all, um, uh, all from uh, the Centre for Digital Build Britain. Some of them also have day jobs as well. Um, what I'd like to do uh, firstly is uh, cut over to, uh, to Mark and I'll get him uh, to kick off. So. Friends, thank you for joining us. I know it's early in the morning 
uh, over there. But Mark, uh, I'll hand over to you, the presenter controls, to kick things off. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So um, I'll just share Mark, my... You, yeah, do you want to put that in presenter mode? Yeah. I thought that um, I clicked the right button. Have I not done that? No, uh, yeah, just in PowerPoint down the bottom, if you go to presenter or slideshow. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Is that okay? That's perfect. perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so I've got a, got a few slides here to introduce the National Digital Twin Programme in the UK. Um, and I thought if I scoot through these pretty quickly uh, and then um, Miranda can talk a little bit more about the information management framework uh, and Sam can talk about the Digital Twin Hub. So uh, what I'll do is give a bit of context for this whole program and introduce uh, what we think is um, a real key data infrastructure for the 21st century uh, that will help to unlock the information economy. The thing that kicked it all off for us was a report that came out from our National Infrastructure Commission a few years back, uh, and that uh, had the main recommendation that we should move towards having a national digital twin. Uh, it also recommended that we should put in place an information management framework to enable it, uh, and, and this is absolutely key to the National Digital Twin, and uh, we'll dig into it in a bit more detail as we go through. Uh, and then they also recommended that we should pull together people from across government and academia and industry uh, to work together to align, to drive, uh, drive forwards towards both the information management framework and the National Digital Twin. So, so that's, that's what kicked us all off. Uh, and the programme was established within CDBB. Now CDBB, the Centre for Digital Built Britain, uh, is a partnership between one of our government departments, uh, BAES, which is the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, and uh, Cambridge University. So a partnership between government uh, and, a, and a key university. Um, and the work of CDBB really uh, in this space uh, is to do these things with the recommendations. Uh, it's to deliver that information management framework. So, so that is core to our job. And we see that as the key enabler of the National Digital Twin. Um, but it's not our job to build the National Digital Twin. That, that's, that's somebody else's job. What we're doing is enabling it. And um, we see that the best way of doing that is to uh, give the tools to the market and let the market build the, the National Digital Twin. So it, it is a, a key thing to understand that we're not actually building the National Digital Twin, but we are enabling it. And uh, that's, that means enabling others to go and develop digital twins and connect them up. Uh, and then it is also our job in CWB to create that alignment that I talked about between government, industry and academia. So um, a, a big, uh, big job to do actually, uh, and it's all in pursuance of this vision, uh, the vision for Digital Built Britain uh, and CWB are the guardians of this vision. Uh, which we can articulate in four words, design, build, operate and integrate. But it's all about releasing the value of better information management uh, across the whole life so cycle um, of assets uh, and systems in the built environment. And I think it's really key for us to see the built environment as a system. Um, and, and I think that if you look at the, the various different layers of economic infrastructure and social infrastructure, the interface of the natural environment, you can see that each one is a complex interconnected system. You add them all up and you get the built environment, which is this most amazing machine that we all live within uh, that serves society. Um, but if we don't see it as a system, uh, then we can't see the cyber physical system. And, and I guess this is a, a really key point for us that we need to see um, the entire life cycle of everything in that system uh, and the national digital twin can potentially apply to, to any part of this. So it's not just about construction. Construction is a really uh, important industry uh, in the UK. It's worth something like 9% of GDP. So it, it's huge, but it's not everything uh, because there's the rest of the, uh, the built environment that is already built. Uh, and we see that uh, digital twins can benefit throughout this whole life cycle. 
So absolutely focusing on the, the use of infrastructure, but also its operation and maintenance. And then, of course, the planning, the designing, the, uh, the building and commissioning. Uh, but I think it's when we see the built environment as a system of systems, then we can imagine a cyber physical system. Um, and if we're going to unlock uh, the full value of that, um, then uh, we can't just focus on construction. We need to focus on, uh, on, on everything. And um, I, I guess what this is really doing is applying the thinking of the fourth industrial revolution to infrastructure and the built environment. It's where we bring together physical assets and digital assets. Uh, we get something that's smart, so clearly smart cities, but that's really about bringing digital and physical together uh, to unlock the value of information in making better decisions. Uh, and I guess that's what we see as being core to the value proposition. So it's not just doing this because it's fun, uh, although I have to say it is, um, it's doing it because it has purpose. Uh, and that, that purpose is to drive better outcomes for people and society. But the route to that is through making better decisions. And so what we see here is a very simple representation of the information value chain, where you're taking data, and data is lovely stuff, but it needs to be properly managed because uh, uh, if you've got rubbish data, you're not gonna, not gonna get those better decisions. So, so you're doing something with the data to make it fit for use. Um, but then all you've got after the end of that is still just data. So you've got to make sense of it. And uh, that's clearly where our analytics comes in and our modeling and our simulation and all sorts of clever stuff that, derive, that uh, gives us insight. And it's based on those insights that we can make the better decisions. And it's the decisions that unlock the value. If we're not making better decisions faster and cheaper, uh, then it's not going to unlock the value um, of this, uh, this information age. And then the better decisions lead to better interventions, the better interventions lead to better outcomes. Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of what we're seeing as the core of what releases the value from uh, this whole approach. Uh, and what you can also see is that same information value chain wrapped around the definition of a, of a digital twin, where you're basically taking data out of the physical world, you're doing something clever with it, generating insights, uh, enabling those better decisions, which can then drive the interventions back in the physical world. Uh, and so a digital twin is much more than just um, a realistic digital representation of assets, processes, and systems. That the thing that really makes it a digital twin is that data connection that means that the, the models uh, are dynamically updated with real data from the real world. Uh, and that, that unlocks this ability to make these better decisions uh, that will have a real impact uh, back in the physical world uh, and, and drive improvement, you know, drive all the value that we want um, um, that, that produces those outcomes. So, so that's what an individual digital twin is. And we can see the potential for that um, across the whole life cycle that I uh, introduced earlier. Um, but that's kind of not enough. We can see beyond that, which is what happens when we connect the twins. So if we've got a digital twin, say, of some rolling stock, which is making us ha um, helping us to make better operational decisions around, uh, around the use of that, um, but we've also got digital twins of track and signaling, why wouldn't we be sharing data between those twins? Doesn't mean sharing all the data, it means a subset of data that's relevant, but some of these connections would clearly make sense. And if that makes sense in the context of, of this example of rail, then it also makes sense to be sharing uh, data a, a layer up between uh, uh, various different parts of transport, so between rail and road and, and air. And if we zoom out another level, you can see the same argument would apply um, across sectors where there's relevant data that should be shared between, say, transport and energy, or energy and water. Uh, and this then sounds very much like that ecosystem that we had um, of the connected, complex connected systems of infrastructure. But now we're talking about an ecosystem of connected digital twins. Uh, and that really is our definition of the national digital twin. We're not seeing it as one massive model of everything. We're seeing it as an ecosystem of connected twins. 
Uh, and we're not talking about connecting every twin with every other twin. We're talking about this being purpose-driven so that uh, effectively the ecosystem gets built one use case at a time. Where it makes sense to have a digital twin to drive value, then you have a digital twin. Where it makes sense to connect digital twins, then you connect them. Um, but it, it would therefore be something that would grow, we see, um, very organically uh, and be, uh, as the name suggests, like, like an ecosystem. And so at the heart of the ecosystem, the cell from which the ecosystem is, is created is really a connectable digital twin. Uh, and, and that is all about um, data sharing. The thing that enables us to connect digital twins is secure, resilient data sharing across organizational and sector boundaries. So it's not just the digital twin itself, but it's the connections between it. Uh, and so we really need to attend to that, uh, that data sharing. And if we get that right, we see that we can unlock uh, immense value to uh, society, to the economy, to business, to environment. Uh, I'd love to dig into this in more detail. And I think it is really the benefits which, which drive this whole thing. Uh, but maybe we can come back to that because we've got um, a good amount of time um, in the, the discussion later. Uh, and then when it comes to how we're going about delivering this, we've set up a, a pretty simple delivery vehicle uh, in the program. Uh, and what that's about is really bringing together the practitioners who we have in the DT Hub, the Digital Twin Hub. Sam will tell you much more about that, um, who are, are learning by doing and progressing by sharing. Uh, bringing that together with work that we're doing um, on a technical solution to enable this secure, resilient data sharing. And we've called that the information management framework. Um, now, there has to be a connection there because anything that comes out from um, the uh, ontological community working on the information management framework really needs to be tested and validated in real life by real life practitioners. But also the practitioners will be coming up with uh, common problems that need a common solution. And so there needs to be that kind of con connection that way. And then the third component of our delivery vehicle um, is what we call the change stream. And this is really recognizing um, that if we're going to drive the, the greatest benefit across the whole of the built environment, then really what we're talking about here is a socio-technical change program. It's not just a technical solution. Uh, and that that, uh, that whole thing about changing um, behaviors and cultures in the industry to unlock the value of this is huge. Uh, and we shouldn't underestimate uh, just how much change is going to be required. And therefore, we've got a, a whole stream focusing just on that. Um, so um, Miranda's going to uh, talk a bit more about the information management framework. So I won't steal her thunder. But it, it is to say that we uh, produced a, uh, an important paper earlier this year that outlines uh, what we think uh, are the key components of the information management framework. Um, and then uh, what we think it will effectively do is produce this 21st century infrastructure. It's a, a data infrastructure. It's kind of virtualized, but it is a genuine infrastructure, just the same way that in the past uh, we, we've kind of recognize the value of physical infrastructure and physical networks like um, energy networks or water networks. Um, this really uh, becomes a, um, a data infrastructure. Uh, and importantly, final, final point from me um, is that uh, it needs to be guided by values. So one of the very first things we did as a program uh, was produce uh, and, and offer up uh, what we call the Gemini principles because uh, we see that it's incredibly important for this whole journey um, to be driven by values. What started us off was that report called Data of the Public Good. Uh, and we are, are kind of compelled by that argument that this must be for public good. Uh, and therefore, we need to attend to uh, the values that drive us uh, and, and constantly be driving uh, towards better outcomes. And, and um, I think, I think it's really apt, actually, that um, that report should be called Data to Public Good because it's that public good um, and unlocking the value for people that what this is what we see this is all about. So that, that was a very quick scoot through. Uh, and I think, Adam, I need to give the um, um, control back. There we go. 
thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. That was great. And and for those uh, for those of our delegates online that haven't had uh, an introduction to the Centre for Digital Built Britain and the general work that you're doing now, that's a, a fantastic overview. Uh, and I'd also remind our um, uh, our delegates that uh, the Gemini principles that Mark referred to um, a somewhat similar set of principles were released late last year by uh, ANZLIC, which is the Australian New Zealand Land Information Council, um, which modelled the Gemini principles for a set of Australian-based and Australian and New Zealand-based principles uh, called the Spatially Enabled Digital Twin Principles. And if you head to ANZLIC's website, you can also find those. They're also on the Digital Twin Hub uh, that we have here. So Mark, thanks so much for that. Uh, and Miranda, um, welcome and uh, really looking forward to you sharing an overview of the work that you're doing um, at CDBB. Uh, I think I've handed over the uh, the control panel to you now and you should be able to share your presentation and screen. So thank you so much and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Um, good morning, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any slides with me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm just going. To, I'm going to do a little bit of talking uh, about uh, what we're doing um, on the National Digital Twin Program in the UK. Whereas Mark said, uh, we're working on principle-based, secure, and resilient data sharing, and I think that's the important thing is. Um, that we're principles based um, and we're designing in this secure and resilient data sharing um, that enables good to be done. Um, I am, as Mark said, I, I work in the common stream and my colleague Sam uh, works, uh, leads the hub and that's what he's going to talk about. And I think those are uh, two sides of a very important coin. Uh, in the hub, we connect people um, with the twin, with the twi with people that are uh, building twins um, and, the, ent and the, the enterprise that are creating them. And whereas in the commons, we're building on that connected, we're working on that connective tissue uh, that will put together twins and unleash uh, the network effects of value. And when we talk when we we talk to people about what kind of twins they're building and why they're building them, we see four main themes emerging. And the and these themes came came through in the consultation that Mark referred to, which uh, closed in the summer on the pathways towards an information management framework. It's um, a relatively easy read if you'll come from a technical background, um, but there's a there's another version which you might like to share with um, your less technical colleagues, um, uh, which is a, a guide uh, to the approach for the national digital twin. And I can commend that um, as a communication aid for you um, if if, you, if that's what you need for. for other people. But I was saying there are sort of four broad themes why people are creating twins. And um, we've got the optimistic people who think that they're going to get um, new sources of revenue through data. Uh, and then we've got the other three three classes of sort of more traditional um, uses of digital twins. Uh, that's asset management, um, everything from performance and availability improvements, life extension, whole life cycle cost modeling, autonomous down to autonomous operation and collaboration. Um, looking after similar assets um, that, that are, are in different or the same situations. That's one. Um, just second is decision support, um, assurance and certification, everything from long-term policy to reduction in failure risks, operational interventions and co-creations and scenario modeling. And the third one and the final one is um, systems thinking. And this is where sort of the where you need to start connecting twins. So balancing objectives on costs, safety, security, and environmental sustainability, and understanding how infrastructure managed by different organizational function organizations or functions can act as a virtual network. Um, so in the UK, we use City Mapper as a consumer-facing app. Uh, to, to bring all these different systems together. Uh, there are other ones uh, worldwide, certainly Google works or move it. Um, but we see those sort of four applications um, um, for, for digital twins. Um, and certainly in hot off the press, um, we learned yesterday uh, about the report from the Smart Infrastructure Index, which surveys um, a whole range of infrastructure companies uh, to understand how they're progressing uh, with respect to both digital maturity um, and digital twins. And, and what was very interesting for us, um, we found out it, it's not um, digital maturity which dictates how, how advanced people are with respect to digital twins. Um, it, instead, it's their approach to asset management and their customer focus, which is the real tell 
um, in terms of how quickly they're going to adopt digital twins and how quickly they're going to unlock benefits from us from it. Um, there's also um, an element of continental improvement. So how good is almost your the infrastructure and the will of um, of, of people in supporting uh, digital twins? But it also picked out, this survey also picked out uh, the challenge of communication. There's a lot of hype and expectation in the world of digital twins uh, and a risk that we're not going to make good and deliver against it. So with that in mind, um, we're working on sort of two parallel strands, trying to strike a balance. Um, we've got some of the best theoreticians in the world uh, creating um, the information management framework. And as Mark said, that consists of three components. Uh, that's the FDM, the Foundation Data Model Seed, uh, FDM Seed, uh, reference data libraries, and integration architecture. And we've got we've got some people who've worked in this field for a long time and have great experience working on that to try and see if they can find, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, the thin slice of this um, of the of this information management framework, which they can apply. Um, and use, um, in, in, particularly in the UK, in the, in the education and zero, co zero carbon schools, schools setting. So we've got some great theoreticians working, but we also have people working in the real world. Um, and they're identifying problems and potential solutions um, to connecting digital twins. And I think it's important that we work with that community um, because what we're doing there is identifying real needs um, and also the route to adoption for the information management framework uh, because we could produce the best um, and, and the, the ultimate um, gold standard of theoretical information management framework. But if we don't see it adopted, um, we haven't delivered the good uh, that Mark talks about. So we're working with these um, Gemini projects, we call them, um, based on the Gemini principles. We're keen to test those Gemini principles. So if you've got any examples where you have tested the Gemini principles um, and found which are easy to apply and, and which you wish you had applied and hadn't applied, um, we're keen to hear from you. We're, we're collating case studies on those. Uh, but we're working now with a Gemini program um, of people who are, who are facing the challenges of connecting their digital twins. And they're sort of falling into three broad areas at the moment. Um, so uh, what's very clear is people are asking for help in creating their business cases. There are, there are benefits, as I said, um, to creating digital twins. And we find those, as I said before, in, in sort of asset management decision support. Um, but the business case for connecting those digital twins is a little bit harder to make. Um, uh, and so what we're seeing is people are trying to borrow um, each other's use cases because they know that if they get additional use cases, there's further benefit. Um, uh, and therefore, the, 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 uh, the case for um, creating and using the information management framework is stronger. Um, uh, and so we're working to support um, the creation of, the, of those business cases. Um, and also we're, we're talking to people who are working on the same asset from two different organizations. Um, uh, now, you, you might have thought this was simple, uh, but um, every time we talk about it, we open up a new range of complexity. Uh, so that we're talking to two linear infrastructure organizations um, who are working um, to, to try and alleviate the effects of flooding. Um, and you, you might have thought that was simple. They would just um, exchange information on those assets, um, but it's in fact very complicated. They, they don't have common um, definitions of things like tunnels or culverts. Um, and it turns out they don't also don't have the same approach to risk management with respect to flooding. Um, in the road arena, people are very worried about surface water, um, but in the rail area, people are much more worried about uh, the soaking of embankments and, and, and landslip. Um, so what we're trying to do there is, is understand how we, we solve that problem, how they solve that problem already non-digitally uh, and therefore how we can um, support them with the right information management framework so that those decisions um, can be made quickly and safely. Um, and, and often it is um, workforce safety, which is a driver for the adoption of sharing um, uh, data. We've seen a great example here in the UK uh, supported by our Geospatial Commission. Uh, where an underground asset register is being built um, and it is the, the, the lever of increasing workforce safety um, that is um, compelling people to share data in a way that they haven't before. Um, so I've talked about the, um, the three uh, Gemini projects, the business case, um, the same asset working on by the two different companies, um, and finally, um, the same asset at different life cycles. Um, so in the UK, we've got a big push on to update our planning system 
uh, and so often uh, the information which is created at the architecture and design stage um, doesn't isn't you isn't useful and isn't used by people who are do, doing planning approval um, and then finally um, at building control stage so again there we're trying to design uh, what might be the optimum information flow and the optimum way of sharing information and the optimum information um, uh, to support um, um, efficiency at planning uh, and and therefore better infrastructure um, for the whole for the whole of the country. Um, so uh, the, all those things are, are going on simultaneously, as I think they need to, uh, because uh, we need to both show people that the technology is possible and available, uh, uh, but also uh, that um, they also plug it into real need that that is emerging from our forward thinking operators. Um, so um, I'm happy to take any questions, but I think I'm handing back to you now, Adam. Miranda, thanks so much for that. Um, and a lot of content in there that uh, I actually hadn't uh, been across as well. So extremely informative. Uh, and, and I've got some questions, questions I'd like to circle back on uh, when we get to it. Um, so thank you so much, Miranda, for sharing uh, that, uh, that work that you're uh, championing. Um, Sam, can we, uh, can we cut to you now for our final uh, sort of uh, overview of, of key, um, uh, key CDBB uh, functions and responsibilities. Let me just hand the reins uh, over to you to control and hopefully you should be able to share your screen uh, any moment. Excellent, looking good. Thank you, Sam. Perfect, thanks, thanks Adam. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm Sam Chalton. I'm here talking about uh, the UK's um, digital twin hub, um, which we've kind of we've done a, a lot of um, kind of collective work with with Adam, um, trying to provide alignment between the two kind of separate hubs that we've um, set up at opposite ends of the world. Um, so, oh, hold on, just one button. Yeah, so as you've heard from uh, from Mark and and from Miranda, um, the nation's digital twins obviously represent a myriad of sectors, um, and within them there's complexity um, as you start to go into greater levels of detail. One of the things that we're particularly keen on emphasising within the digital twin hub is behind those kind of sectoral badges is actually quite a complex um, set of organizations um, and companies, whether those be um, asset owning companies or components of the supply chain. But all of those feed into this uh, kind of uh, this component of infrastructure. And once you start breaking that down and sort of then combining it back up into the national digital twin, you end up in a position that you've got an extremely uh, complex ecosystem with a huge number of organizations involved in that. And is what we're trying to be able to accommodate within the hub is actually that point of bringing it all together and creating a single environment where all of those um, different bodies can collectively work together so that we can get to a point where we are um, uh, able to kind of drive forward in, in a kind of more efficient manner than we might otherwise um, be able to. And once we can start to do that, as Mark has already emphasized, there's quite a few um, benefits that can come from that. But I think one of the core ones that we're really hoping to kind of encourage through the Digital Twin Hub is that agility and time saving and that supporting innovation. If we think about it very simply, there's always going to be certain companies and certain bodies that are able to and have the appetite to um, test these things and test these technologies and test these techniques at quite an immature phase in their life cycle. And that is great for those companies that have that capacity to do so, um, but it's not always something that is accessible to companies. And is what we therefore want to be able to, to ensure is those lessons that are learned from the companies that do have the capacity to do so is filtered down to those that don't. 
so when we start looking at that in the context of the National Digital Twin program, the DT Hub is an absolutely core component of making sure that we can deliver the outcomes that we want to see. And that is something that we're really um, absolute on, on being able to, to support. And is what we're going to see over the coming months is that actually really improves and increases in terms of maturity as we as we move forward. So what's happened so far? So in a similar vein to the Digital Twin Hub that exists um, as part of the Smart Cities Council, we've got uh, our, our Digital Twin Hub that's live at digitaltwinhub.co.uk. Um, this kind of consists of um, two or three uh, main parts, um, which I'll talk through in a bit more detail, but the principle that we need to kind of focus on is it's there to support people again, whatever phase in that life cycle of development um, they are at. Uh, and that is absolutely kind of integral to, to the pro process so that we can kind of learn together, uh, as Mark said before, and then try and progress through kind of shared um, innovation and through sharing. And that's what our kind of um, key, key kind of objectives are. And it is what we're also hoping to see is that by creating a forum and a medium for people to exchange this knowledge, we actually produce an opportunity for people to um, kind of self-discover best practice to some extent. And it allows us then to take on that, that role and that opportunity to nurture and cultivate that best practice. And in time, that then provides an opportunity for us to mature those into standards. So we're still at quite an early phase within the hub. Um, we've only been going since um, around about April. Um, we, we started with pretty much around about a dozen members. And in the time since then, that's grown now to almost 700 members. So that's growing quite significantly. And that is reflective really of the, um, the interest and the appetite um, amongst uh, uh, the industry at the moment to adopt these technologies. We have been very UK focused um, to start with, and I think that's been an important first step because it's important for us to understand where is the UK kind of the UK's head at on this. And then as we start to consolidate our own picture, in time we'll then be able to open that up to, to support a minor, more international community. In time, we start, we'll be able to, as I've said, develop standards. Um, and we've started some of the activities to support that. So we've done a, um, a landscape review of the current um, standards uh, environment. Um, that's currently going through review, but that will be um, made available in some guides going forward. And then more importantly, we're producing um, what we're referring to as a standards roadmap. And that's gonna look at the gaps that we have identif identified through that landscape review and then where possible, um, start to see where we can look to begin developing standards, which can have some kind of immediate value and immediate impact. We, you can, we're looking to adopt um, a kind of agile standards methodology. So we're working with um, BSI, the British Standards Institute, and they've developed this framework for the creation of agile standards. Uh, and principally what that means is that we can get something in front of people much sooner than we might otherwise be able to, with it, which was such a rapidly evolving field, such as digital twins, that that is pretty kind of essential. And then we can iterate it. So as long as we get a fairly kind of consistent set of baseline fundamentals, we can start to kind of refine it and iterate it as we move forward. And that really is kind of allowing us to to be that kind of some of our parts and really be that collective um level of um of ideas and knowledge and that will create a really strong and and kind of rich environment full of depth where we can collectively move forward but also start to collectively overcome some of the challenges that we we are we know that we're going to encounter so if we look at some of the ones that we, we hear quite frequently um, from, from our clients and our members, 
it's not always about developing digital twins for new assets. One of the big challenges, how do we create digital twins for existing or legacy assets? And some of that becomes quite problematic when you might need to um, fit sensors onto existing assets. That's not always um, as easy as one might imagine. Um, if I reflect on a, a conversation with um, Sellafield, which um, does a lot of kind of nuclear decommissioning work, um, when you've got kind of one meter thick concrete walls, Wi-Fi doesn't necessarily work that well. So smart sensors become um, inherently quite problematic. But when you start thinking about, okay, a problem with them, maybe you can take a similar approach to how they fit sensors into pipe work to, to detect leakages. And that's what we really want to encourage is actually taking solutions to problems or taking challenges that may not naturally kind of parry together and actually look at whether there's learnings that can be taken from one another to actually accelerate each other's journeys. And that's really gonna maximize the potential um, that we, could, we can achieve in the long run and the, and the race at which we can get there. So who is it for? Um, we're, we're quite open in terms, of, in terms of who can get involved in the hub and we're gonna be increasing that level of openness going forward. But it's really important that we're able to support things that are kind of quite early in terms of research all the way through to what's happening, what is the cutting edge and what's going on within asset owning organizations or what's going in within um, companies that may be developing digital twin solutions. And we really want to bring them all together and provide them a, uh, a kind of a forum to have those, those kind of those healthy discussions that need to be had. But also we're, we're very much aware that it's important to create appropriate delineations within the hub so that if asset owners want to have conversations that it may not be appropriate to have um, uh, kind of uh, companies that produce um, solutions being involved with suppliers, um, how can we create that sort of segmentation within the hub? So one of the ways that we, we do that is we created a concept of networks and those are closed networks. So we can have a, a water sector network which is um, managed by the community for the community and they can control the membership of those. And that means that we can they can have those more open discussions. If they've used a supplier solution that wasn't fit for purpose for what they were doing, they can share those sorts of um, feelings in a safe environment with each other. But we then take on that moderation role of when those conversations may progress to a point where there is value in surfacing those findings to the wider community, we are there to accommodate that and to support it. The last thing we want to do is create this awesome, rich environment with a huge myriad of organizations and people there. And we actually just create loads of little cliques which don't share anything. So we've really got a challenge there and we've really important that we do surface that, that information out. So in terms of who's already involved, um, as I've said, we've got about 700 members, um, which I think a third of which are, are from asset owning organizations. Um, to just give you a sense of some of the, the key ones that are involved, we've got the likes of kind of Heathrow, um, are the owner of the largest airport in the UK, um, got multiple water companies, got Highways England, as Adam has already mentioned, uh, and many, many, many others. But we're not just trying to get those members on there so that we can shove the logos on a slide and say, look at us, we've got these members within there. We're trying to actually then surface what digital twin activities they've got into something we're calling the digital twin register. Um, it's in its infancy at the moment, but that is going to become an extremely valuable resource um, as time goes forward and it becomes more complete, allowing us to see at any given moment in time what the current uh, kind of overarching agenda looks like within the digital kind of twin ecosystem. And that is absolutely essential because what that lets us do is see that if there's a lot of focus in twins that primarily develop, deliver, I don't know, environmental benefit, and actually we need to see some, we need to try and encourage the delivery of digital twins that deliver societal benefit, but perhaps the business case isn't as clear for organizations 
um, CWB and the NDT program can then look at what interventions it might be able to kind of put in place to really help overcome some of those challenges and support organizations going through that journey. And then we're actually able to also work collectively with those organizations. So when we've got things that we're developing, such as the information management framework, we can draw on this really rich community that exists within the hub and start testing out our thinking as an earlier phase as possible. In terms of what's in it for everyone, I think that's quite an important part. Um, creating the hub can't be something that just delivers value to the program. And yes, it's good to say to people um, that it will allow you to talk to peers that are kind of working in your, in your sector, but and it will allow you to, um, to progress in a, in a faster manner. It's also quite a good way for just um, helping people to develop thinking that might be at quite an immature phase, but also get access to resources that can accelerate that journey. So when Miranda talked about um, the Gemini program earlier and developing things like standard business cases and things that we can utilize, those can become resources that are available to members so that when somebody um, from a, a, an energy organization decides, right, I need to get the, the board on board so that we can start developing a, a digital twin to maintain pace with our competitors, they're not starting from square at one. They're not having to refine all the evidence to, to justify um, their position, but that exists. They can draw on it and they can start to accelerate that journey forward. So, um, as I said, um, we exist at the, the digitaltwinhub.co.uk. Um, please um, feel free to log in and, and register. Um, a note on that, that there's going to be a slight delay if you're from if you're not UK based and getting you registered but come the new year we're going to start being able to onboard that to a much broader um, range of members um, if you register it will still enable, enable you to um, receive some updates on things that are going on and we'll be able to kind of give you a nudge once things have moved on to a point that we can extend the invitations um, but there's also some open resources on there. So there's a number of digital twin talks that we've hosted um, with um, UK and wider organizations looking at where they are in their digital twin journeys. Those are all then published on YouTube, but they're, they're all linked to from the hub. So feel free to go and have a look at some of those um, resources uh, and, and we can take it and, and kind of we can work together from there. So that's it from, from, from me. Um, before I pass back to you, Adam, I think Mark's got uh, a couple of just points to make about where things are going next with the program, um, but that should then round us off. Excellent. Yes, thank you, Mark. Yeah, not not really much um, to to say because I, I think uh, what would be really interesting is is um, getting into the the questions and seeing you know what what people want to know, but but just um, a kind of a brief um, a brief view of the way forwards. Um, is I, I guess that we see um, uh, we see a lot of activity in this space just now, and, and I think that you, you guys are feeling the same thing. Uh, so it feels to us like uh, we've we've struck a chord, uh, and so we see that it's really important to um, kind of to, to move forwards on that. Uh, and I think one of the key things that, that will come out of that uh, will be uh, collaboration. You know, hopefully that we, we can work closer with you. Um, we're, we're also looking at what's going on in North America with the Digital Twin Consortium. Um, and I, I think that what, what, what will make sense here uh, is having uh, a kind of a, a growing body of people who are moving in the same kind of direction. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we think it's really important for this whole thing to be driven by um, by, by ethics and standards and values. So, so um, sharing those, uh, I think, will be important because, um, in some ways, that, you know, that there is there is some philosophy at stake here. That if we firmly believe in using data for the public good, uh, we're going to have to stand up for that um, because you know that, that there are there are other approaches to data. Uh, shall we put it that way, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think if we want to see data being used for public good, uh, I think uh, those who want that to happen need to stick together uh, and support each other. So, so what I'm hoping uh, is that um, as we move forward, we can see an acceleration 
uh, in response to uh, demand uh, and that um, actually somehow or other we'll we'll keep up with that uh, and some and you know somehow satisfy that demand so yeah I think the um, uh, looking forward looks quite exciting to me well uh, for us over here Mark and, and, and Sam and Miranda and, and I know, I know uh, the, the, the sort of Smart Cities Council has uh, has sort of monthly regular uh, catch-ups with particularly yourself, Sam and, and Mark and some of the other team members. Um, for others, um, getting the appreciation of uh, the digital twin approach in the, in the UK, I think is is quite new, new to some, but also fascinating to others. Um, just some Just some comments from me before I then go to some questions. Uh, and for, for our uh, for our delegates that are online, please use the questions box to um, share your thoughts and and comments and questions. Um, what is what is quite clear um, is that um, in your instance in the UK, you've got very clear uh, national leadership and guidance. This is a national agenda. Um, government is 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 heavily involved and and underpinning it. Um, you seem to have um, had that critical spark to catalyze it through that document, you know, data for the social good. Um, and we don't have any of those sort of conditions or uh, attributes here in terms of our um, our marketplace. So um, that, of course, is why the Smart Cities Council is is trying to do what it's doing in providing a little bit of leadership and catalyzing. Some, some dialogue and advocacy and discussion. Um, what I'd like to start with in terms of questions, and, and I'll ask it of all three of you if I can, um, if you were to share sort of three lessons of the, the program so far, three lessons from what you've been able to um, experience and achieve, what would you share with us if we were to sort of, you know, start preparing to do and you know mobilize a national approach to digital twin um, what would you share with us in terms of your respective three lessons learned can I start with that question and I'll open it up and and any of you can start I'd love to get uh, your thoughts yeah, shall, shall I kick kick off with that because, yeah, yeah uh, thanks, Mark. Think, um, uh, I mean, it's a really challenging question, and, and actually, I should give that more more thought because it's it's worth digging into. Um, but but the the kind of the first three things that come into my mind, um, I, I'll go with those. Uh, and one of them, I think, is about um, building consensus. It's kind of related to what you're saying about the the kind of the clear national leadership. Uh, I I don't think that there's any way that this kind of thing. Uh, can done be done by one party. Uh, you, you need to move together uh, in a pack, uh, and so I think that the building the consensus is is hugely important. Um, we have been uh, you know, immensely fortunate in the UK that um, the infrastructure clients uh, have um, have a group. They meet together. Um, they they uh, I mean, it's called the infrastructure client group. Uh, the kind of the names on the tin um, and they've been meeting together um, sharing best practice as clients uh, for about 10 years at least I mean 10 years to my knowledge uh, and, and having that group um, meant that it was already possible uh, to have a sensible conversation with the asset owner operators and, and start to build consensus in that in that zone uh, which then I think means it's easier to have conversations with suppliers because suppliers want to line up and do what the what the, the clients want. So, so I, I would say number one is about building consensus because you can't go it alone. Number two for me would be about um, the values because um, I think it would be really difficult to backfit values later. You know, if this thing runs away with itself and it, it somehow got the wrong values, um, it would be really, really difficult to unpick it and go back. So I, I think it's really important to get the, the values that will drive the overall program established very early on. Uh, and, uh, and just establishing them early on doesn't mean that they're going to stay. 
I think it's the kind of thing that needs to be fought for, you know, to keep going back to those values. Uh, and, and I would uh, I would strongly advocate uh, having something like this being values driven, because otherwise uh, you, you can see that there are all sorts of uh, forces in the market which will take it down a different route that won't then protect the public good. So I would say the values is really important. Uh, and, and then the third one for me is that um, it, this is not just a technical thing. It feels technical because it's about um, digital twins and you know, we can get very excited about the tech. Uh, and, and I am a tech guy, you know, so, so you know, I, I love all this stuff. However, uh, it's very clear that this is not just about tech. This is a socio-technical change program uh, and the change that goes on and needs to go on in relation to behavior and culture and you know, change to commercial conditions and all the rest of it, you know, that's gonna be at least as big a challenge uh, as a technical challenge. So, so uh, I think it's interesting, you know, just listening to myself, it's interesting that the three things that I've come up with are, are all fluffy things. You know, they're, they're not technical things, they're fluffy things. Uh, how on earth did I come up with those three things? But I think, I think they are really important. So that, that would be mine. I appreciate that, uh, Mark, the, the three sort of lessons learned of the program so far. So, so Sam, Miranda, uh, how would you sort of add and, and sort of elaborate to what Mark has shared there? I'm happy to go next. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, there's been a couple of core learnings. I, I, coming at this and recited different lens, obviously, from, from leading the, the hub, but I think one of the key things that has kind of struck me going through this is the importance in not trying to formalize too quickly and not trying to define or trying to set boundaries too quickly where organizations have very different interpretations of digital twins and we know that creates challenges i think when you start out it's important to be quite permissive to really allow it to have some sort of fluidity to it so that you can you can learn from what what is the best across those different areas and only when it then becomes appropriate and obvious do we want to start adding some of that formality and that kind of leads me then into to the second point which is it really is important to to just learn by doing and i think what we, we always say that to the members of the hub and to those that are engaging with the program but i think that has to reflect onto us as well so we could spend years and months um coming up with perfect solutions to problems whether that's the information management framework or that's the digital twin hub and so on and so forth but actually we just need to expose our thinking at as early a point as possible with as many people as possible so that we can reach that early point of consensus, as Mark was saying, but also just because we think something may deliver value doesn't mean that um, the community is actually in a position to kind of receive that value at that point in time. And that can be quite difficult when you're looking at things quite strategically to be able to take that step back and actually go, actually taking something quite simple like, how do we conceptually define a digital twin might be all that is needed right at this moment in time, but those become the building blocks to what we're trying to do. And I think the last thing I'm very keen to emphasize within the hub, and I think we've, I've learned and I've seen from other kind of um, births of big technologies and births of big kind of movements like this is that, the smarter the customers are, the smarter the solutions will eventually be. And I think that is absolutely vital that if we can create educated asset owners to understand what they want by a digital twin, and a digital twin has to be purpose driven, and we don't want it to just be the most glossy piece of technology that actually doesn't do anything kind of underneath the surface then we will end up with better solutions. We'll end up with customers that are asking for things that can deliver value. And therefore, in turn, our ability to deliver a national digital twin will be that much easier. 
so th those are my three points um but yeah i think those are important things to reflect on you know they're great sam um miranda i'm going to come to you in a moment but sam before we leave you and i'd like each of you to comment on this one the the, the work consensus is a really good one i think uh, and, and, and i like that to what extent do you think data for the public good played in kind of grounding the consensus or, or, or sort of catalyzing that journey towards consensus? Do, do you think it played a role at all, Sam? I'll just get you to sort of comment on that before we then pass to Miranda and then back around to Mark. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of what it did was galvanize people around the opportunity um, for deriving um, kind of public good from from data, um, and I think is what it helped to reflect on is that if we can reach a point where we have got consensus with respect to expectations, it can drive things both from that kind of more natural kind of Darwinian standpoint that Mark always kind of talks about of allowing people to naturally achieve consensus. But when you've got really strong drivers from kind of senior bodies like the National Infrastructure Commission, it allows us also to apply some of that top-down um, pressure, whether that be through regulation and the like. And that, and actually, it has really kind of got us to a point where those leading minds can take the work from Data for the Public Good and start to drive that forward to create some initial consensus. And now as that's starting to, to develop, it provides an opportunity for government to come in and kind of impose to some extent those types of consensus, whether that's through regulations or the birth of standards. Okay, uh, so, so Miranda, cutting, cutting to you, you might want to address that one first around that sort of consensus issue and particular the, um, uh, the, the, that sort of key report, but also keen for your reflections on sort of you know top three lessons learned so far with the with, with the program at CDBB but I'll, I'll let you share oh you seem to be on mute Miranda sorry oh right I'm definitely back yes. now we can hear you, yes Thank you very much. Um, well, um, as ever, uh, Mark and Sam um, are, have been extremely humble when they've talked about um, the, uh, the sort of the evolution of the National Digital Twin Programme. Uh, Mark, in particular, um, his, his approach of of humility um, and his 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 able to ability to synthesise um, the infrastructure client group um, should not be underestimated. Um, but um, he he wouldn't dream of saying that. Um, uh, and I think the, the, the comment on the report is, is significant, but it's also worth remembering that data for the public good didn't emerge out of nowhere. Um, uh, we had an industrial strategy, um, we had a Royal Society report on the impact of data and human flourishing, um, and at the same time, uh, there, there were other reports coming out of other bits of, of the UK government. And this appetite to attack cross silo problems, the realization that the optimization of individual networks wasn't going to address things like the climate emergency, uh, things like pandemic response. Um, you know, where, when a railway goes down, it isn't just the railway that forms part of the recovery mechanism. And if you just optimize a single network, um, you're not going to get to societal outcomes. And there's that, that growing realization, um, I think that, that enabled the, um, the fertile ground um, on which on which we've been lucky enough to build, um, and um, your your question is is really well put, and and I really enjoyed uh, listening to the other two answers. Uh, could help me have a chance to think about it, and I, I think certainly what Mark and and Sam talk about in terms of balance um, and values is really important. Um, this wouldn't have worked if it had been an overt commercial endeavour. Um, people would have found you know, the, 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 it's, it's like the underground asset register, which is based on workforce safety. Um, if you make the case inarguable and principles based, um, you're much, much more likely to garner support. Uh, but with wide ranging support, um, what you have are um, very disparate audiences who want to participate and help. Um, and their methods of help can be quite different. 
Um, so I, I, I think I reflect on when we started on create the journey of creating the information management framework. We had everything from leading conceptual thinkers from places like the Alan Turing Institute in the UK, which is you know, the foremost um, place for academics, um, and they, we, were, we were asking them to collaborate with seasoned industry professionals um, who'd worked o o at the gritty end of information management their whole lives. And, and these people didn't even have the, the language with which to disagree effectively. Um, and, and we had to try and get them into the, into the same page. Um, and, and it's really important that we work with all sides of that debate uh, because they all have something to contribute and they will all be part of the solution. Um, but giving them the safe space to collaborate um, it, it was, is a significant challenge um, uh, and not just a technical one um, that, that has to be addressed and, and the patience and the humility um, to go about finding that balance um, is something uh, that, uh, that, that, that um, isn't, isn't a lesson easily learned. Um, and um, the other big lesson I think is, is to go with the momentum. Um, I've been reflecting for a number of years that the collaboration within the water sector in the UK is much higher than it is, um, for example, in the power or the transport sector. Um, possibly because there's a, there's a, there's a, a thing uh, around public good in the delivery of water. Um, uh, but also because you know, there's only so much of it and, and it, you, you're all really in the same game. Um, and, and it's certainly the collaboration in the water industry and the leading in, uh, work done by um, Anglian Water in particular, where they have um, worked very hard to share information with their supply chain um, and as part of their local community, means that we almost have a baby test case um, for information sharing in the UK. And it's that momentum and, the, and the, the positive stories they're able to tell about carbon reduction, about the positive effects of collaboration for both their customers and their shareholders, um, that means that with a right policy environment, um, the right level um, of balance um, means that we have been able um, to develop relatively quickly. And, but I, and I think you need all three of those in the mix. Yeah, okay, thanks for... Uh... For sharing those comments, Miranda. Um, uh, for our delegates that are online, I've just noticed a uh, quite a rapid influx. Uh, it seems that our uh, our time zone differences have plagued us not only uh, where where you guys are in London, but also here in Australia. That, that, that's an error somewhere in um, in our scheduling system at the Smart Cities Council, unfortunately. So for our friends that have just been joining us over the last ten to sort of 13 minutes. Uh, we, we, we've been uh, online for uh, about an hour now and there's been some presentations summarising some of the key work programs with uh, our friends here from the Centre for Digital Built Britain. Um, and the session is recorded so you'll be able to catch up with those. So you've come in just as uh, we, we've entered into, into some uh, sort of meaty discussion and dialogue. Um, we do have uh, we do have some good questions here from earlier on in the questions box, which I would like to um, I would like to share, and I will go there with without um, with sort of the risk of um, uh, with the risk of opening up a, sort of a, a bigger discussion that could take another hour. Uh, but I'd like to talk about standards, uh, and, and I think Mark and, and Sam, you both touched on those. Uh, so just so we're clear, you have a digital twin standards roadmap that is not far away. Um, can you sort of confirm that and what that might be trying to achieve? And then um, talk a little bit more about the idea of the agile standard, and I understand that the standards development process is also, I think, happening on the back of some lighthouse projects. Can you talk around sort of that that standards process and how it's sort of part of your your program work areas there? Yeah, can I can I maybe kick off on that and and then um, hand across to to Sam on uh, some of the the detail. Uh, and the thing that I, I would I guess I'd want to uh, kick off with is um, making a distinction between different types of standards that, that we see are going to be relevant in this space. Uh, and, and if I can kind of characterize those as being uh, bottom up standards and top down standards. So I, I think that there's going to be some really important standards that, that will grow from the bottom up from this experience that we're gaining from, um, from learning by doing, as, as Sam had said. Because what we'll learn from that is uh, practical stuff about how you go about 
starting on mm -hmm. the journey with digital twins. Uh, and, and we, 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 and not just that, but um, uh, kind of practical how-to guides on what you do in this space. Uh, and, and I think that the very best way of developing that kind of standard uh, is is from practice and from practitioners who are learning and you capture the best practice, you turn it into guidance, you turn that into standards. And, and Sam can talk about the agile approach in, in a moment. So, so that, that's one type of standard that feels to me like it is best grown from the bottom up. But there's another kind of standard that I think needs to come uh, from the top down. Uh, and that's what we're working on in the information management framework, where we see this semantic solution to a problem. And the problem is about uh, reducing the friction in data sharing. Uh, and part of the solution we see as, as being about um, enabling a consistency and quality of data uh, across a whole, uh, a whole industry. Uh, and and that's, that can't come from the bottom up, it can be tested by practitioners, but the suggestion kind of needs to come from, from somewhere else. Uh, and so I think when it comes to standards relating to ontologies, particularly if we're gonna go with a top level ontology, you know, that, that, that kind of thing needs to come from a different direction. So I, I think uh, when, when we're considering standards, it's really important to, to see these two different directions and, and there's actually a completely different nature of the standard. Um, and I think if we model them up, um, then we're likely to get it wrong. So, so that would be kind of my context setting. Um, and then I'll let Sam do the detail. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks, thanks Mark. Mark. Um, yeah, I mean, speaking to, to BSI, uh, the British Standards Institute at the start of it, when they would traditionally undertake a standards activity like digital twins the way to do it would generally to be kind of do quite strategic standards then sort of do kind of quite process focused and then go down to the kind of technological level which is fine but i think where we're in an environment where things are changing so quickly and people need something now we haven't necessarily got that luxury of time and if we did try and ignore the fact that there is a kind of time pressure on it and go and do it that way we would find things had moved on too quickly and um, by that point in time so the approach that we've taken with bsi is to map out where the opportunity for standards is um, and that's across a, a kind of a number of different kind of vectors you've obviously got kind of data standards you've got technology standards and there's obviously uh, different pieces that can kind of fit together to make the puzzle there and then what we're looking to do um, and when we talk about these agile standards is identify a point uh, sorry a part within that that roadmap which we feel can deliver value um, in a kind of realistic time frame and then just start that process of developing standards and that's where this kind of agile process kicks in um, so we've obviously had in the past the kind of the formal standards the PAS standards um, which is a publicly accessible specification I think it stands for um, and is what they've kind of gone for is now creating this agile standard which is um, not a million times different to a PAS but in effect is what you're trying to do is create an early draft of a standard in effect but make it a formal standard um, but with a kind of agile stamp on it is what would then likely happen is that might go through uh, three or four kind of six monthly iterations that then becomes consistently available to people to make use of and um, that may in time then become a formalized kind of uh, full full kind of um, standard but the idea is that value can be gleaned from that in the short term uh, when i heard about it my concern is and i suspect some people on the call would echo this concern is do we not open ourselves up to a problem of i bought into standard version one by standard version two all the work i've done is redundant does doesn't that just defeat the purpose of it being agile so i i often try to think of it instead of being iterations they're increments 
So what you have at phase one um, with the first publication doesn't therefore become invalid what you, when you get to the second step. But maybe you've got an additional layer of detail or you've got specifics around an area that weren't necessarily covered um, sufficiently in the first step. So if we took um, a data standard for IoT as an example, um, that's obviously slightly out of scope, but is what you might see is that, right, if we all use this sort of relatively open approach and, and we, we structure data in a given way, that's great. When you get under phase two, it might start to talk about, okay, what would IoT standards look specifically in the smart city space? And it starts to build in those layers of detail. And that's kind of what we're working through with BSI is how can we develop that picture and mature it? When we are able to publish this roadmap, that'll be available as a collective resource um, for, for everyone. Um, and we'll have slightly kind of different ways of, of presenting that. But I think is what is really important is we get, don't get kind of too um, stuck on uh, just how many opportunities there are for standards, but try and narrow that into where can the immediate value be gained. I, I, I think it's a it's an interesting one, isn't it? We had uh, I think it was in our conversation this morning, um, our earlier session with Digital Twin Week and our case studies. We we spoke about standards, and there was a comment made here. From one of our uh, local audience members around um, standards aren't in Australia stand, the view was standards aren't the problem it was our use and application of them um, now there's many many components component parts of digital twin that are standardized you know data management and and BIM and you know th there's a whole range there um, I, I I do wonder sometimes whether we are lacking that strategic standard uh, and and if there was an agile one to stand up quite quickly um, something that kind of resembles that you know PAS 181 PAS 180 kind of let's just all get on the same page with what a digital twin is you know we've got sort of a, a third thinking it's just BIM and a digital model we've got a third thinking that it's BIM plus plus. We've then got folks like me that think it's just something totally different, same but totally different in terms of being a data platform that can connect everything, um, and it's a tool for transparency and building trust. But you know we don't often hear those words transparency, trust, democracy when we talk about digital twin. But technically speaking, uh, it can certainly be a, a platform for things like that, building those kind of um, opportunities because it's all about data. So. Um, is sort of if there was a priority and I don't want to preempt what might be in your roadmap um, do, do you think uh, a, a, a rapid um, even the Gemini principles sort of the next layer down almost is, is there something that we we could all really benefit from in the next 12 months because I fear another year or two particularly the mood here is that uh, the digital twin falls into that sort of, you know, that 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 hype curve, the trough of disillusionment, disillusionment. It becomes another one of those things that kind of we never were able to realise. I heard about it for three years, but uh, I've ne it's never been procured. I haven't had a client ask me for it. Is there something rapid that we need to stand up, maybe? Yeah, I mean, without again preempting what comes out of it. Um, and there will be a degree of consultation with the members. I think there is a definite possibility that that may be one of the key areas that um, the, the community would like to see. Um, and reflective of that, we have a number of activities going on to lay down some of the, the initial thinking, should that be the direction things choose to go so that we're not starting um, from scratch. So one of the activities um, we have going on within the hub at the moment <clears throat> and we'll be doing a series of consultations on is can you can you have a binary test for a digital twin um, in effect or, or, or is it appropriate? Is it a scale of twinness or whatever? So we're starting to mature our thinking in that space 
um, and to see where it's appropriate to start to see if we might be able to standardize some of our thinking uh, and as soon as we get consensus from the community that there is definitive value in progressing things in that vein then I think that that will naturally be the direction we choose to go in um, I don't know if you've got any differing feelings Mark or not no, I think that's exactly right. I, mean, I think there's real value in listening to, to what the community wants. Uh, and, and this, this is um, a large part of that bottom upness that it needs to be in response to what people actually need and, and you, what, what is relevant. But, but I, I think you're right, Adam, that, that you know, there's going to be some stuff needed pretty soon because uh, otherwise things will run away with us. Um, but but I, I think a lot of that will come from uh, uh, what I just said about what, what people need, but also uh, will come out of the actual practice of, of trying this, you know, seeing what happens and seeing what works. Um, because I, I think there's no point in writing down some theoretical standards that, that haven't been proved in the furnace of, of practice. So, so, I mean, it seems to me that, that, that they have to be practical standards. So certainly that class of standards that I described earlier as being the bottom up ones, uh, the top down ones, I think are, are, are a little bit different um, and th those need to be tested um, but I think that they need to come from a different furnace basically. Yeah okay M Miranda I think you were signalling that, that you, you've got a comment here. Um, I would just add that there's an enormous amount of um, uh, false humility uh, in what people regard as digital twins. Um, we we've been trying to get people to, um, to publicise their, their twins um, and um, they, without exception, say, oh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, mine's not as good as so-and-so's mm -hmm. or mine isn't really a twin. Um, and um, I am firmly of the view uh, that it needn't be real time. It absolutely needn't be 3D. Um, if you've got um, a really efficient process for sharing information, um, and I hesitate to say spreadsheets because they've had a bad press uh, recently, but you know, if you've got an effective way of sharing information that uh, contributes to a better operation or better outcomes for customers, you've got a twin and you've got lessons that other people can learn from um, and other people can take and, and develop. Um, and I think we've got to be, which is why you know, Sam and I have quite a, a good debate about can you test for a twin? Um, and I think the test can't be technology driven. It's got to be outcome driven. Um, and uh, we've got we've got to um, stop uh, putting a, a technology wrapper around this and, and understand what twins can deliver. You know, that, that that's very interesting, Miranda. And, and dare I say provocative as well. I, I, I personally agree with about half of what you said. Um, but, but, but let's all let's all step back for a moment. You know, we're all part of a global community. And, and, and Sam, in your um, uh, in, in your sort of presentation, you, you, you shared how sort of the, the hub is sort of the place where we're, you're trying to form the community. We're trying to do the same over here with, with the Digital Twin Hub for Australia and New Zealand. Um, is there any sense that, and you know, I can jump on the phone with you, Sam and Mark every month like we do to catch up and share. Is there any is there any sense that we might be able to truly go global here and actually move forward together as a global digital twin community, or do you think that might be a bit fanciful? Do we have any precedent for that? Any views on genuinely learning from each other around the world, given that many of of your sort of client group and and many of the large asset owners, developers, and others, and banks and insurers are global. Could that be an idea that gets advanced? Um, I, I do think it could, yeah. Uh, uh, and I think that there are precedents. Um, that I don't think that they're um, necessarily directly applicable, but, but one that I think is, is relevant um, is looking at mobile telephony uh, and some of the standards relating to that. Uh, and so you can see now GSM pretty much as a global standard um, but, but I think one of the reasons why it became a global standard was because it was open and it allowed many, many people to, um, sorry, just one second. Somebody's running a tap. Um, but um, CDMA as a, um, as a kind of a comparison was, was closed and more commercially driven um, and kind of didn't become that same global standard. So, so I, I think when it comes to digital twins, there is real benefit 
in aiming for that kind of global standard and particularly if we're looking at the connections between twins because it, it kind of wouldn't make sense if the UK came up with a, an answer that only worked in the UK and everyone else did something different, it, you, you, it would make sense um, if the same kind of high level rules applied more generally. So, so yes, I think we need to build that, that international consensus. Uh, and I think that international standards bodies can be a really key part in, uh, in facilitating that. And now what that, what it doesn't mean is that um, information uh, that is kind of secure and private gets shared globally. What it does mean uh, is that we can reduce the friction in sharing if we choose to. Uh, and, and those are very different things. Uh, and, and I think that the, the kind of standards that we might be moving towards with the information management framework, those kind of things really need more broader, um, broader buy-in and broader appeal. So yes, I'm, I'm saying yes, let's go, let's go for the something global. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Miranda, Sam, would you sort of be um, a, a opposed to those comments or, or supporting anything that differs from Mark? Uh, no, I, I would absolutely endorse what Mark said. Um, it, it, there's uh, there's no one jurisdiction uh, which is large enough, um, uh, no one country-based jurisdiction which is large enough to drive this. Um, and the risk is that um, if any one country comes up with um, one one answer um the global players who are who are profit motivated um or at least profit responsible um will override it um so uh, we we've got to use the the um tools we have um in order to build something which works for the greatest number of people um uh, and so no i agree with what mark says yeah, yeah okay. kind of building on that just just very very briefly i think i think that those kind of high level standards that i described earlier on as the kind of the, the top down ones uh, I think it becomes really important that if, if they are driving towards using data for the public good, um, that they should be non-proprietary and non-acquirable. It would be entirely possible. You can imagine a world uh, in which those data standards uh, are proprietary. You know, that there's one big company that dominates things and said, you know, use our standards. We've got them. You can use them for free. Uh, but that, that can then exclude others. Um, and I don't think that that would be the best answer for the world. So I, I think that these high level standards, which don't need to be a lot of them, you know, it's, it's just mm. it's just what unlocks the rest. I think that that that, that needs to be non-proprietary and non-acquirable. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, I'd like to share my screen and show you show you all something that came out of uh, our opening session. Um, uh on on monday just a couple of days ago we surveyed uh, we had almost a couple of hundred people on the the call the webinar and um we, we had what is that almost you know 70 people respond to this survey we asked them sort of how would you prioritize some of these things for 2021 um and what was interesting is is that after um some quite significant um comments and, and questions about standards in the questions box that we had, um, that there was a sense that sort of standards was, was going to be the, the, the priority of, of the year. Uh, it was quite interesting to see, I mean, there's not a lot in this, okay, they're all a bit about the same, but it was quite interesting to see these outcomes here. Um, documenting use cases, and again, this morning in our case study series, it just seemed like people were just hungry, like, show me this thing. I, 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 I want to see it in action. I, I, I want to sort of believe it rather than sort of just the talk and the words. Is, is there any sense of prioritization for CDBB in, in 2021? I mean, you've got a lot of component parts to the, to the program, but uh, are you sort of seeing or hearing that there's a particular area of, of priority or priorities that need to be advanced now that you're yeah, sort of part way through it? It's interesting, isn't it? Because it reflects this pretty much. Actually, I think I think this is really good. Uh, and and what we've heard from the community in the D DT Hub is absolutely that first priority is that people are hungry for use cases. Exactly that. Mm. Uh, and we're making a bit of a distinction between uh, use cases, business cases, and case studies. We think all of those are important. So pe people are needing help on putting together business cases. Uh, and and this is all part of the the digital twin toolkit that we're starting to put together. Um, but, but yes, we absolutely recognise that first priority and, and that's kind of what's happening in the DT Hub. 
So, so yeah. yes, yes to that one. Um, we we are we're continuing to work on number two actually uh, with the the UK government for um, for what happens in the future. Uh, and I would say that another key priority uh, for us um, is to be making progress uh, on the core standards um, of the information management framework. Because if we if we don't do that, um, then we're not going to be able to unlock the value of connecting digital twins. We might make a lot of progress on individual digital twins and advancing the state of the art in digital twinning. So we want to do that for sure. But if we can't connect them, then we're missing a lot of the value. So, so uh, that that is for us another priority to to move that on. I would say there's a third priority, which is in our our change stream, which is about engaging, engaging with the community, uh, and you know, continuing to get the message out uh, for even those who are not ready yet to start experimenting with digital twins, is start to get their heads around it. You know, just just to prepare because you know it feels like this is happening now, uh, and so you know it's. It, I described earlier on a socio-technical change program. It's another priority for us to be engaging with the right communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've we've done quite a bit of um, stakeholder analysis, um, uh, segmenting the you know the, the the big picture of stakeholders, understanding which stakeholders we have to work with first. But but that is another priority for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, just on business cases, Miranda, I I, I noted. Um... Uh, in, in your presentation, you spoke of business cases as well, and I'll, I'll write down a little note for myself to come back to you. Um, I, I, I do know there's a couple of business cases that are in the works here at a government level. Um, is there is there anything that resembles uh, a, a, a template to business cases? Uh, are we all going are we all going to run off and use our own criteria or our own interpretations? I mean, I. Well, I suppose I'm blatantly saying, can I steal from you when you've done one? But um, <laughs> is, is is that maybe something that we could all work on as well, do you think? Uh, and we must. Um, uh, you know, th there would be no higher um, uh, uh, compliment than to have a, a template stolen were one to exist yet. Um, and, um, I, and and certainly, you know, it, 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 is, it is pressing and, and the, the situation has made it even more pressing. Um, I was on a call with a client and they said, look, it, because, because um, our, 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 it was an airport, because our airport is extremely quiet, um, we have a unique opportunity to resurface the runway. Um, and um, I'm trying to put together the business case that we should also be investing in our digital infrastructure, but I need to compete with the resurfacing of the runway. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So, you know, give me your business case now. So, you know, the, 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 need, the need is pressing. Um, uh, but I, uh, but but I think we're get, not going to get there in one bound. And, and I'm 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 tempted by the analogy I've heard this week um, that we hear the community requiring standards, um, but at the same time arguing about the unique um, things at play within their own client. And I think we've got to manage that tension. You know, that there will be a template and there will be tools that we can use to create a business case, but they won't be universally applicable uh, because every situation is slightly different and that's why data is slightly different it was all collected for slightly different purposes um, but i think the route to a business case um, is certainly through the use cases i mean that's why I'm, I'm delighted to see that bar at the top there because the more we understand each other's use cases and the more we are able to describe and quantify the benefits that come from those use cases through digitization through digital twins and ultimately through connected digital twins the more we can heap together those benefits uh, the, the more attractive those business cases are going to look. Um, and, and so I think we've, we've absolutely got to be um, positive and as, as, and, and as encouraging as we can about the sharing of use cases um, and the sharing, the sharing of benefits. Um, and, um, and then we will start um, to, to bring together uh, the tools that enable us to navigate our own individual and labyrinthine business case approval processes. And that's for the individual twins, that's for connected twins, and that's for the, um, the, the government uh, business case as well. All of those things are linked, um, but they all start with use cases. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, well let's sort of see if we can compare notes as we, as we evolve. Uh evolve some more business cases. Can I ask you, um, and I open to, to anyone to comment on here, um, 
where the UK is at with cities, local government, municipalities in the digital twin agenda conversation movement. I noticed sort of, you know, some of those big organisations and logos, Sam, uh, uh, that you had up there, you know, Highways England and water utilities and, you know, big infrastructure asset owner operators. Uh, where are we at with the humble city and the digital twin? You know, they're, they're, they're sort of neck deep in the, uh, at the moment in sort of trying to open uh, data portals and data sharing and, you know, collecting data and COVID and understanding what's happening in cities. Where's the city level digital twin discussion at or not over there? Uh, I was going to pitch in and talk about London. Um, so mm. um, I, I, I was on a webinar yesterday uh, with the GLA, the Greater London Authority, um, link available on the DT Hub soon. Um, and um, the, the they I've always been impressed by London. They've got a number of digital twins which meet um, a number of different uh, and discrete use cases. Mm -hmm. um, and and therein is is another challenge. You know, how do they bring all these excellent digital twins together? Uh, but they have um, uh, and they've had an air quality model um, for a number of years now, which has been come out of university, and they've adapted it um, in the last uh, few months uh, to look at busyness. Um, and they're trying to understand the busyness of the city uh, so they can understand the health of their high streets, uh, but also understand people's different approaches to social distancing. Um, so it's a, it's a brilliant piece of work and has been, and has been um, immediately useful. Um, uh, and I, I certainly think uh, that cities who, have, uh, who are big enough to have skills like that um, uh, um, we have, really have excellent use cases um, and, and do develop excellent digital twins. Um, uh, the challenge is to make them universally applicable um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and because of the different, certainly the, one of the problems we have in the UK is because of the patchwork of accountabilities that cities have, um, they have quite different motivations. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we've, got, we've got to share the learning, um, and, um, but, but, some, but the skills are unevenly distributed um, and, and therefore it's, it's hard um, to get them to, to come together. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mark or Sam, any comments there around cities? Or well, Miranda nailed it? Um, I mean, she she definitely nailed a, a kind of the, the the king of the examples. Um, I, I think to, to kind of to generalise the point, um, cities are kind of the key uh, use case for um, connected digital twins, because it's it, it's that it's in cities that um, all the infrastructure sectors come together to serve people, uh, and so if you are anticipating digital twins of transport networks and energy networks and water networks, where do they all come together? It's in a city. So those digital twins need to talk to each other in a city. Um, so, so yeah, I think that, you know, the cities are the, the, the granddaddy of use cases. Um, and we see um, a lot of activity in um, digital twins in cities. Uh, what we're not yet seeing um, are the real connections between the digital twins. Uh, which is obviously what what we're working on as as core in the the national digital twin program. So so we're working with cities um, and you know looking to advance that agenda. But but yeah, absolutely, cities are, are to totally in the um, uh, totally in this program, uh, and I think will be actually where we see some of the most value unlocked. You know that that's where it's going to be. Yeah, uh, that, that's great to hear. No, I think it's, it's also done. the most complex. Um, you know, it, it, because it because they all come together. You know, you've got three health authorities, you've got four four water companies, you've got all the energy companies. Um, uh, so it is where the so I think I might disagree with Mark. You know, it is where the greatest benefit lies, but also where the the highest barriers are. And I think we will see um, if we start small, like Mark said. You know, if we just connect twins that are going to show benefit. You know, we, and we we build it um, that way. Um, you know, trying to tackle um, uh, you know, the digital twin of London is just a massive and, and unattractive uh, problem. Um, but but putting together these small small bits piece by piece is is how we're going to get there. And, and on that um, sort of idea of piece by piece, Miranda, um, we have certainly seen in the last 12, 24 months in Australia uh, and also New Zealand. 
um, a, a real sort of um, surge of interest and investment in e-planning. And so really the digital transformation of the planning and development approval process, developers lodging their applications more in, you know, sort of, um, you know, d data driven um, formats uh, and, and models that I would hope would be an opportunity for us to sort of, you know, by default, you know, allow the, the, the digital twin to sort of evolve piece by piece, application by application. Is he planning a, um, a, a sort of a, a, a concept or uh, area of activity over there, that digital uh, sort of, you know, application or, or submission of, of developments at a municipal level? I would note that certainly New Zealand is world leading yeah. in, in its approach to planning. Um, it, it, it certainly had you know, one of the best digitized, digitized planning, planning and building and land management systems in the world. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and, but there, there is we've had we've had a recent white paper with respect to planning, um, and it's been a, a, an almost a, a Cinderella project um, of our of our catapult, um, our government sort of startup supporter. Um, we recognise, uh, well, they have recognised um, that there is um, an awful lot of wasted effort. Um, uh, that takes place in planning. I, I spoke about it before. You know, the, the information which is um, created at the architecture and design phase isn't the same information that is used by the people who are apportioning planning. Uh, and then there's a different set of information that's required um, for building control. And that sort of inefficiency at a time when there simply aren't enough homes uh, uh, is unacceptable. Um, and therefore we're seeing a policy drive for the improvement in the planning process. And also uh, in the same way that we've talked about previously, there's uh, there's more technology and the ability to process data um, is, is, is increasing, means that we are, we are seeing um, a, a great interest in this area. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um... Look, I'm I'm going to bring this session to a wrap. We've we've had half of our audience online for almost two hours now. Uh, we we've, we've had the other half online for for not not as long. Um, we've recorded this session, so uh, we'll, we'll be able to certainly circulate that. It's actually quite nice, isn't it, to say that it'll be on the hub, um, and and we're finding um, that that the Australian New Zealand Digital Twid Hub is 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 becoming um, uh, more widely used, which is great. As, as to Sam. Uh, what you've been sharing around the, the DT Hub uh, in uh, in the UK, which of course we modelled ours on, and, and and thank you so kindly for for sort of supporting us with that. Um, so for our audience who are online, um, you know you, you you've been hearing uh, incredible insights um, from a national program in the UK uh, with, with Mark and Miranda and, and, and Sam. Uh, who who all have day jobs and also uh, also uh, play key uh, roles, facilitation and leadership roles at the Centre for Digital Built Britain. Um, just a final uh, final few comments from uh, from me uh, for our guests, um, our, our audience guests from Australia and New Zealand. Our awards program open today. Uh, our Smart Cities Awards program. You can head to the website scwaustralia.com. Uh, to download the submission guide, uh, two weeks for round one, so rapid, rapid time frame to get entries in. Uh, we look, we look forward to uh, having you with us as we celebrate on the uh, the third of December our winners. But uh, head to that website for some further information. Um, look for for you, Mark and Miranda and, and Sam. It's been great to uh, to connect again, and Miranda to meet you for the first time. Um, we're we're loving we're we're loving the sort of collaboration and camaraderie between sort of the work we're doing in Australia and what you're doing there. Um, it seems like through the Digital Twin Consortium in the US, we're able to sort of bring another big sort of nation into the fold. So really looking forward to seeing uh, if we can sort of realise um, that opportunity of a, a bit of a global uh, sort of approach and movement here and, and some good knowledge sharing as well. So, uh, so for now, I just wanted to say um, thank you again on behalf of our audience, uh, Sam and, and Mark and Miranda for for joining us, it's been great. I know it's early in the morning over there. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you uh, again soon, but thank you so much for joining us for Digital Twin Week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.